What is the performance paradox? What is the difference between learning while doing and learning by doing? And how can we overcome the performance paradox and change our lives and the lives of others? I'll explore these questions and so much more with Eduardo Bersinio, author of the new book, The Performance Paradox, Turning the Power of Mindset into Action. When, when, you, when you pick the book up and it says The Performance Paradox, it, it begs the question, what is, in your mind, The Performance Paradox? And, and how does it, you mentioned chronic work. I'm, I'm just wondering, how does it, um, the, the concept of chronic work factor into this paradox? And what are some of the key implications of chronic performance? Yeah, so the performance paradox is a counterintuitive reality that if we focus only on performing, our performance suffers, our results go down. And so what does that mean? Well, the first, one thing that I learned, you know, in working with my mentor, Carol Dweck, and, and got the chance to work with um, the late Professor Anders Ericsson and other, other thought leaders and practitioners too, I realized that I was unclear between the difference between learning and performing and and that we can all really benefit from getting really clear about this. So a way to become clear about it is to get step out of our context and look at people who are fantastically skilled at what they do, who are world-class, um, for example, athletes in, in domains where performance can be objectively measured, where these people are, are just so good at what they do. And sometimes what we tend to think kind of vaguely, we have a sense that the reason somebody becomes fantastic at what they do is that they have spent a lot of time doing that thing that we see. Like if we see a fantastic tennis player, they are fantastic because they've spent 10,000 hours playing tennis. And if you look at the research, the research is clear that that's not true. The reason these fantastic performers get so skilled is that they spend a lot of time doing something very different from what we see. What we see is them performing in what I call the performance zone, which is, you know, when they're doing, you know, they're playing a championship match, they're trying to win. They're trying to focus on the things that they do best, trying to minimize mistakes. That's the performance zone. But so if they're having trouble with a particular move, they're going to avoid that move during that match. But then after the match, they'll go to their coach and say, coach, I have to work on this particular move that I was trying to avoid during the game. Now, we have to do this. Like that's what we need to put attention to. And that's a very different activity, uh, what I, which I call the learning zone, um, which is when we leap into the unknown, when we do things that may or may not work, when we engage in activities that are designed for improvement, not designed for performance. Um, and both of these zones are critical. The performance zone is how we get things done. And it's a big way that we contribute to others and that we change the world. Uh, but we need to habituate and systematize both of these zones. And often most of us uh, gravitate toward chronic performance, toward being in the performance zone all the time in our work and our lives, just trying our best, doing things as best as we know how, trying to minimize mistakes. And if that's all we're doing, uh, which is what chronic performance is, then we stagnate. It actually works when we are novices, when we're just getting started at something we're so bad, like if we just try to do the activity, we'll get better. But once we become proficient, we'll stagnate. And then we'll, because we're working hard at the activity and not getting better, we tend to develop a fixed mindset, the belief that we can't improve further because we're trying hard and we're not getting better. And the the, the reality is that we are just working hard in an ineffective way. We're hard, working hard at performing without engaging in activities that are designed for improvement. That's a great segue into sort of combining my next couple of questions, which was, you know, the effort to perform versus the effort to improve. And and how does it relate? You mentioned just now, Eduardo, the, the idea of a fixed mindset. And I was wondering if you could explain the difference between so-called fixed mindsets and a growth mindset. And to what extent, given what you've written in your book, is a growth mindset essential for overcoming uh, that the, the, the chronic performance uh, conundrum, if you will? Yeah. So to overcome the performance paradox conundrum, uh, we we need kind of four what I call cornerstones of change. And, and I'll mention what those are. But one of them is a growth mindset, which you just mentioned. That was something that was discovered by Carol Dweck, my mentor, Stanford professor in the 1980s. It's done a ton of research on it. And now like thousands of researchers have done um 
research on growth mindset and a growth mindset is the belief that people can change is the belief that our abilities and qualities are malleable they're things that we can develop over time so for example if we think that a great leader is a great leader because they're natural leaders that tends to reflect more of a fixed mindset right the reason people somebody's great at something is because they're naturals at it rather than anybody can become a better leader whether you're already a great leader or just starting out you can improve further that's a growth mindset or we might see kind of extroversion or introversion in fixed ways or in malleable ways in a fixed mindset or in a growth mindset or athleticism or the ability to work with numbers or with words and we can see these different abilities as things that people either have or don't have intelligence is another example we might see people as you know their intelligence fixed at a certain level that's a fixed mindset about intelligence versus anybody can become smarter that would be a growth mindset about intelligence and and this belief that we can change is essential in order for us to engage in learning behaviors uh, that that lead us to improvement but it is also not sufficient it is necessary but not sufficient because if we believe that we can change but we are not clear about how to change. We think that we just need to work hard at something and we'll get better from just executing. Uh, then we'll try hard, we'll fail, we won't get better, and then we'll develop more of a fixed mindset, right? I can't improve because I'm trying to improve and it's not working. Um, so the second thing that we need is not just to believe that we can change, but also understanding how to change and how to improve. And that's where the learning zone and the performance zone comes in. Third, we need a why, we need a reason to care, right? So if we, if we work in government, we need to kind of connect and reconnect with uh, what, why do we care? Why is the work we do important? What, what difference does it make in other people's lives and in my life and in my colleagues' lives? Um, and so because we both the learning zone and the performance zone require effort, they require different forms of effort, to your point. In the performance zone, we're, we're putting effort into the things as to, to do them as best as we know how, trying to minimize mistakes. In the learning zone, we're leaping beyond the known. We're experimenting. We're trying things that may or may not work. We're soliciting feedback. We're thinking about mistakes and talking about what we can learn from them. And those are things that are different than just executing, but they're both involve time and attention. And so we need a reason why we care in order to engage in both. And then finally, it's really helpful when we also develop the sense that we belong in a learning community, that the, our colleagues are also learners. They're people who are interested in continuing to improve, continuing to gain new insights, new strategies, and in collaborating both in the learning zone and the performance zone so that we can share transparently, talk about what we're working to improve, what we're struggling with, asking for ideas from the other person, different strategies, giving and receiving feedback. Um, and when we are in that community where people value learning and when people engage in learning behaviors, their social status rate goes up, uh, then that, that, that motivates us to be motivated and effective learners. Throughout the conversation, we've been talking, Eduardo, about these zones, performance and learning. I, I was hoping if you could just spend a little time briefly explaining the essential aspects of each zone. And, and, and more importantly, for the audience, from your perspective, what determines which zone one is in, you know, during the day, if you will? Yeah. So when our goal is only to get things done as best as we know how, trying to minimize risk, trying to minimize mistakes, then we are in the performance zone. When our goal is to improve and our goal is to get better, um, then and we are engaging in strategies designed for that, then we're in the learning zone. And when we're doing both, because we can we can do both at the same time, just like we can have salt and pepper at the same time, we can engage in the learning zone, the performance zone at the same time. Um, that's what I call learning while doing. Uh, and that's when we have both goals, right? We have the goal of getting things done in a way that's also going to lead to new insights and new learning and, and improve skills. And that's when we have both of those goals and we're using strategies to achieve both of those at the same time. You know, you noted in your book, Eduardo, we don't learn by doing, but we learn while doing. Um, how can we into, and you may have already touched on this a little bit, but I was hoping you could elaborate. How can we integrate the learning zone and performance zone? And what does what goes into learning while doing? And how does it differ from learning by doing? Yeah, so there's this term, this common term called learning by doing, which I think the people who do it well do what I describe as learning while doing. But learning by doing 
I think it's confusing because it implies that if you just do, you will learn and you will get better. And and that's not true. That you know the people who uh, first conceived of this idea of experiential learning and studied it and and were theorists around it, they didn't say you just do and then you'll get better. They actually talked about a cycle and different things that you do in order to get better. And so I use this term learning while doing to remind ourselves that we can learn while we do, but that means we need to be deliberate about how we do things in a different way so that we learn along the way. And, and so that involves trying things in a different way, not doing things always, because sometimes we like the idea of improvement, but we don't like the idea of change very much. And the reality is that if we haven't changed, we haven't gotten better. We're the same. In fact, we've probably become less effective because the world has changed while we haven't. And so the more that we understand that we can change and we develop systems and habits to continuously change proactively rather than only when we make mistakes reactively, then the more that we can improve over time. And, and so it, it involves changing things. It involves experimenting. It involves soliciting feedback often. It involves being deliberate about what do I want to improve or what do we want to improve as a team and how are we going to go about it and putting in, in place the habits and structures in order to not just engage in the, in the performance zone, but also in the learning zone along the way. You know, um, you have a wonderful quote uh, from uh, Warren Bennis, and you mentioned it earlier, the, the myth that uh, the leadership myth that leaders are born, and, and he points out that's nonsense. In fact, the opposite is true. Leaders are re- made rather than born. How important is this insight? And to what extent are great leaders great learners? And the advi- are there any advice or strategies you would give to today's burgeoning leaders? Yeah, so it is really important. Sometimes we think about leaders as what makes a great leader as a natural leader. They either have it or they don't have it. Um, but it's really important to remind ourselves that no matter how good or bad we are as a leader right now, we can always get better and we can always learn, you know, effective leadership strategies. We can practice, we can get feedback from people around us, you know, develop allies. We can say, Hey, you know, I would love for you to observe me in this meeting and get me feedback, you know, after the meeting. So those are some of the things we can do. And, and what's important with leaders, often we tend to think that when we become a leader, we are supposed to act like a know-it-all. Like I have all the answers I'm sure of myself And we might get the sense that if we act like a learner, other people will lose confidence in us or in the organization. But we need to create the coherence, the mental coherence, the mental models within ourselves and within our teams that make us us understand that actually feedback and learning behaviors are what makes us stronger. They're going to enable us to better navigate the rapid pace of change and to drive change. And so we can be highly confident that we'll get to success. And these are the behaviors that are going to enable us to get there. So uh, one last question. Um, How might overcoming the performance paradox change our lives and the lives of others? Well, you know, the we live in a world with very complex challenges, a uh, lot of change. And so engaging in the learning zone helps us navigate that change and, and create the change that is going to make the world a better place. But the the the, the learning zone and in, in, in incorporating the learning zone, the performance zone together changes not only the results, not only the outcomes, we, we can perform better and that's important. We can affect more impact and that's important, but it also changes the journey, right? Because when we when we discover more, we ask more questions, we we develop better relationships with, with the people around us because we're more curious, we're asking more questions, listening better. Um, we are experiencing less anxiety and depression because you know the ongoing pace of change is something that's normal and that we can learn from, that we can get stronger from. Um, and, and it's also something that generates joy as we explore, discover, experience more awe. It, it makes the experience of life richer. And that's what the last chapter is about, is about how incorporating the learning zone and the performance zone changes not only our outcomes and our results, but it also makes the process of life and work better. This has been the Business of Government Hour, a conversation with Eduardo Bersinio, author of the new book, The Performance Paradox, Turning the Power of Mindset into Action. Be sure to join us next time for another informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving leadership and its effectiveness. Until then, subscribe, download, and listen to the entire interview at iTunes, Spotify, or on your favorite podcast app, and as always at businessofgovernment.org.